Okay, I'm Matt Siegfried, everybody, and uh, local historian. I've been doing a lot of work on Ypsilanti's African American history, just the general history of Ypsilanti. I am not from Ypsilanti, but I've been here for about 10 or 15 years. If you'd like, you can ask me more questions about me, maybe why I'm interested in this later. But as this warms up, you're going to see this face come on the screen, and this is who we're going to talk about today. Okay, so this is H.P. Jacobs. This is the person that the mural is going to be based on. And let's, this is just a, a sense of who he is. And first of all, I want you to take a look at his face. Uh, this is, I think a lot of his personality comes through this picture. A lot of will, a lot of determination. Okay, so H.P. Jacobs, who was he? He was a builder of black worlds after the Civil War. Father, husband, brother, self-emancipated. What does self-emancipated mean? What does emancipated mean? Free. Free. So if you're self-emancipated, what does that mean? You freed yourself, right? So he, he, he freed himself. We'll go into how he escaped bondage, but he freed himself. He was a janitor at Eastern Michigan University. He was a Baptist pastor. He founded Second Baptist Church here in Ypsilanti. Is anybody a member of Second Baptist? I've been there. Okay, so he founded that church. He founded all of the black Baptist churches of Mississippi. He was a teacher and educator. He founded the Natchez Seminary, which is now known as Jackson State University. Anybody ever heard of Jackson State? Yes. One of the, the foremost uh, places of higher learning for African Americans in the entire country was founded by the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. He was a politician. He was three times elected to the Mississippi State Senate. He was a Natchez City Councilman. He rewrote the Mississippi State Constitution. He's a speaker, organizer, leader, businessman. What does this say at the end of medical his doctor. name? MD. At the age of 65, he got his medical doctorate degree. So he is an extraordinarily accomplished man. So let's find out a little bit about this remarkable person. Okay, so here he is. He was born as Samuel Hawkins. H.P. Jacobs was not the name he was born with. His slave name was Samuel Hawkins. He was born July 8, 1825 on the Dill family plantation outside of Asheville, Alabama. And here it is, so this little star here, and you can actually see this is exactly where the plantation is on the landscape. Here's Asheville. Asheville is outside of Birmingham, Alabama. So uh, that's where it is. We, it's it's kind of in the mountains, so it's a little different than we often think of plantations way down in the lowlands and stuff like that. He learned how to read and write while he was in bondage. He was, apparently he was a really small kid and he was too small to have work in the field so he was told to take care of an elderly invalid patriarch of the family. And that's how he learned how to read and write. And learning how to read and write would become incredibly important to H.P. Jacobs because it is how he got free. What he did was he wrote his own freedom papers for him, his family, his wife, his children, and his brothers. They escaped uh, from slavery. They took the master's wagon. They took his, they liberated those horses and cart. And look at this. All the way from Alabama to Detroit is 750 miles. So they arrived at the Detroit River on August 19, 1856, was just about three weeks later, and they were stopped several times, so they made really good uh, uh, pace up here. We don't know the exact route they took. I would love to know that story. They get to the Detroit River on August 19, 1856, and there in the river, H.P. Jacobs is baptized, and he sheds his slave name of Samuel Hawkins, and he takes the name H.P. Jacobs. And H is Henry, we know that. P, I don't know. Jacobs is really interesting because the rest of his family also takes Jacobs and his daughters, even after they're married, will continue to use the name Jacobs. So we think of that now that women don't take their men's, their husbands' names. Well, H.P. Jacobs' daughters didn't take their husbands' names. In the 1870s, they kept their names. So they moved to Ypsilanti by about 1858. They're in Ypsilanti and he becomes a janitor at EMU. As soon as he's in Ypsilanti, he becomes one of the most prominent African Americans in the city. So within a couple of years here, he's organized a church, a school, and several uh, social organizations, benefit societies. Okay, so here's H.P. Jacobs in Ypsilanti. This is actually, believe it or not, an old picture of Ypsilanti. This is the first ward school. Does anybody recognize that building? It's still there. It's on South Adams Street 
I think it's the Mount Olive Baptist it's on the Church. South side. What's that? It's on the south side. Yep. Yep. That building is still there. Uh, for the African American kids in this room, if you were alive in 1900, that is the school you would have gone to. We had segregated schools here in Ypsilanti. How did that begin? Well, H.P. Jacobs started the school for black people because before there was a school just for black people, black people could go to the white school, but they had to sit in the back of the classroom. So what happened is, is all the black parents pulled their children out of the school. Rather than be humiliated every day and sit in the back of the classroom, they demanded their own school where they could be treated with respect. So H.P. Jacobs sets up their own school. So segregation is complicated. It's not just white people saying, you go over here. It's black people sometimes saying, we want to protect ourselves from humiliation and racism, and we're going to withdraw a little bit. Here we see H.P. Jacobs coming back to Ypsilanti all the time. He's always coming back to Ypsilanti. His daughter becomes, and their husband, who's the fa most famous black barber in Ypsilanti, they're like high black society in, in Ypsilanti. They have the balls, masquerade balls. They live closest to Michigan Avenue. They're doing well. They're sort of, uh, sort of Ipsy yuppies, black yuppies from back in the day is how you would, might define them. Um, but Emancipation Day is really important. That's August 1st. We don't have time to talk about Emancipation Day now, but I hope you guys investigate it because it was black people in Ypsilanti's yearly celebration. It was the most important day of the year for black people in Ypsilanti. It was a public holiday from before the Civil War until about 1930. If you guys were alive 100 years ago, August 1st would be the most important day in the calendar. And it's when you celebrated freedom to be able to go to Canada, when they stopped slavery in Canada. And it meant Canada was free. So it's not about ending slavery in the United States. It's about Canada being free. And there's two places in the whole world that celebrate this special holiday. Right around here, Detroit, Canada, and Trinidad, Jamaica, those places in the Caribbean. What yep, question? What year was that? Uh, 1834 is uh, when slavery is abolished in the British Empire. Okay, but all of this is part of a much larger Ipsy story. And okay, so 15% was African American back in the day. African Americans are now well over 30% of the city, so one third of the population. Everybody in this room, black and white, is an inheritor of this history. All of this history is part of you. It's part of your community. For some of you, it's part of your families. Uh, Ypsilanti, South Adams Street, is a really important place. People who lived on South Adams Street, they lived in a period where they were slaves, where they escaped from slavery, where they fought in the Civil War, where they went back down south to open schools. And then, they, at the end of their lives, Jim Crow came and reversed all of that. So imagine the kind of arc of your life to go from slavery to the, all the possibilities of freedom to Jim Crow. These people lived remarkable lives of some of the most important events in our history. But it, and it keeps continuing. This picture here is from the 1970s, and this is when the black action movements shut down Eastern Michigan campus to demand that there be black studies on campus. And the union, the people just working on campus, the janitors and stuff, they all went out on strike in support of the students, and the leader of that union was a guy named Floyd Kersey, whose great-grandparents were on the Underground Railroad. So if you want to know what the legacy of the Underground Railroad is, it's all around us in Ypsilanti, and it is not in those rich white people's homes on the river. It's in your communities. Yep? Sorry, what's uh, H.P. Jacob's daughter's name again? What's that? What's his daughter's name again? He had several daughters, but his, his oldest daughter, who would become sort of the substitute mom, was Anna Louise Jacobs de Hazen, was, and she kept her name Jacobs. That was the one that married the barber. Yep, yep, exactly. So here's a couple of other people. This is Margaret Eaglin, a latter-day H.P. Uh, Jacobs. She hitchhiked up here with her husband in the 1940s and became the, she became a teacher at Perry, if anybody went to Perry. She, yeah. Okay, she became a teacher at Perry. Um, she um, um, desegregated Perry because when the last case for school desegregation in Ypsilanti was 1978, everybody. So I was alive when that happened. And uh, Margaret Eaglin was an amazing woman. She was the leader of Ypsilanti's civil rights movement all during the 50s and 60s, the Martin Luther King period. Our leader was a woman named Margaret Eaglin. This is the first black man to ever be elected city council in Ypsilanti, and he was a UAW militant. He was like a UAW organizer. All the first black elected officials are UAW members. And his name was Frank Seymour. He's a local member? Yep, local member. Yep. His name is Frank Seymour. 
And he would become, he went from UAW factory worker to becoming the chief publicist for Barry Gordy and Motown Records and one of the wealthiest men living large in Detroit. So that's Frank Seymour. Uh, the first black mayor was John Burton. And John Burton was like our Coleman Young. I don't know if you know who Coleman Young is. He's the mayor of Detroit now. I'm getting my age. Uh, Coleman Young was a really kind of, when I was growing up, they were, Coleman Young would have been called a race man. And that's, and that's what uh, John Burton was. Yep. You said the schools in Ypsilanti were still segregated in 1978? Yes. That was only like, that was even 40 years ago. Yes. Oh. My, mom, wow. My mom was born in 79. Yeah. The, the, the schools for preschools were, that's why, that's why Perry is now for all preschool children. It used to just be for south side of Ypsilanti. And so it, they changed the name from Harriet to Perry. And Perry it is did. after Dr. Perry. Perry is a black doctor here, a dentist. So yeah, no, Ypsilanti had segregated schools. Between 1890 and 1920, six African Americans graduated from Ypsilanti high schools. Six, that's it. So you guys, <laughs> imagine that. But again, back then a lot of people, black and white, didn't graduate high schools. You Most people yes. didn't. Come participate in the mural and come uh, be part of making history alive in Ypsilanti. All right, thank you.